Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Joel Amin Jr. and I'm the program manager of the Catalyst Fund. I am so excited to be here with you today in partnership with the Delaware State Housing Authority hosting our Catalyst Fund workshop entitled Getting Developers Ready to Submit. The goal of this workshop is to support you all in putting together as high quality of an application as possible in a quick and efficient timeframe. This workshop is intended for those who already had or have plans of submitting a project for this program. So we hope that this is not necessarily your first time hearing about the program or that you all referred to the previous outreach session recording sent out in the very invitation used to sign up for this event today. I would like to start off first by sharing our agenda for the day. It is broken down into eight specific sections that we will be exploring in detail over the next hour and a half or so. We hope that you can attend the entire presentation. However, we will be recording for those who cannot. As you can see, the majority of this presentation will be focused on the Catalyst Fund submission requirements. This program is unique in nature, given that it is tied to federal funding, and we will require all applications to strictly follow the guidelines and submit all due diligence requested of you. If you fail to meet the requirements in a timely manner, you will not be able to move your application forward. This will also be a competitive process, so it is of the utmost importance to put as much quality and intention into your application as possible, carefully reviewing all questions, due diligence checklist, and follow-up emails that you may receive. We will also open up with brief introductions from both ourselves and the DSHA team, provide a quick overview on the program, understand what it means to be ready to submit, discuss our feedback mechanism, the program timeline, and then open up for Q&A at the end. We will be using the chat feature to receive questions, which will be answered again at the end of the presentation. With that, let's dive right in. As I mentioned earlier, my name is Joel Amin and I'm the program manager for the Catalyst Fund here at SMIR. I have the pleasure of introducing Ms. Deanna Sargent, Vice President of Sinair Community Connection, and Wayne Boda, our loan officer with Sinair Lending. Would you two like to say hello starting off with Deanna, please? Thank you, Joel. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining. We hope that you get a lot of, out of this uh, webinar workshop, um, and hopefully it helps you prepare to submit um, a strong application for our upcoming Catalyst Fund round. I am not sure that Wayne is on, so I would like to now hand it off to the DSHA team, please. Thank you, Joel. Good morning, everyone. My name is Rochelle Knapp, and I am the Chief of Special Initiatives here at Delaware State Housing Authority. My primary responsibility is acting as the program manager for the Catalyst Fund. So I am the contact person for the DSHA side of this program. I will now hand it over to Michaela Conroy, who works with our partner, Good morning, everyone. My name is Michaela Conroy, and my colleague Katie Rose and I are here today on behalf of Cone Resnick. Thank you very much, all. Sinair is a community development financial institution, one that is mission driven and prides itself on creating opportunities for those underserved communities through real estate development and lending activities. We create out-of-the-box solutions to tackle challenging issues across diverse communities. Some of the specific products and services that we offer are pre-development loans, acquisition loans, permanent financing, short-term gap or bridge financing, and community development financing. The Catalyst Fund is designed to support efforts to address vacant buildings and lots in communities disproportionately affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Its goal is to address vacant properties, which we know pose health and safety hazards, depress values, and present barriers to community stabilization. 
These properties often cost more to rehabilitate than they could be sold for, especially when trying to keep the prices affordable. This is the challenge that the Catalyst Fund aims to address. Developers with interest in renovating these vacant properties can apply for construction financing through Sanair or access the subsidy without using our construction loan from DSHA directly. However, this presentation will be focusing on the construction financing option. You can learn more about the self-funded route option through DSHA's beautiful new website and potentially later in this presentation from the DSHA team. The scenario construction loan is set with non-negotiable terms. The financing will ultimately be reviewed and approved by DSHA to ensure that the development project is eligible for sales gap subsidy to be provided by their team. The sales gap subsidy will only be available upon completion and sale of the home, along with the submission of all required documentation. This is also when the developer fee will be released which is the lesser of 15% of total development cost or $20,000. Here is a map of eligible areas to remind you all that this is a statewide program. We have created a tool which will allow you to simply type in an address and determine whether or not it is in an eligible area. And again, this is located on our website as well as the DSHA website. Now that we have had our quick Catalyst Fund Refresher, let's dive deeper in. There are four main requirements that we are evaluating when it comes to being ready to submit. They are all equally as important as we cannot move a project forward if these four items are not collectively met. The number one item, and this is a big one, that often made the difference in an applicant moving forward or not was having a path to site control. You have to show us that there is a plan in motion or an agreement that will truly allow you to purchase or finance if already owned an eligible property. Secondly, all project eligibility must be met. This means the type of property, the location, entity status, education or training requirements, and more must all be met. Thirdly, all due diligence must be present. This will come from the due diligence checklist that we will explore later in this presentation. The faster your due diligence is in, the faster our team can process your application. Finally, a notice of intent to apply must be submitted by your group. This notice will be due on May 15th, prior to the round closing of May 30th. We need you all truly to be ready to submit rather than turning in an incomplete application as there are many steps to this program. I want to emphasize again the importance of submitting this form as we will not be able to accept your application without this document. There are four requirements to a Catalyst Fund submission, all of which will require your attention to detail. We will examine each of these four components individually so you can further understand what each item looks like and entails. The first is your completed application inclusive of a signed cover page. You would be surprised how many applications we received unsigned and it's the easiest part. Please do it so that we do not have to send extra emails. The second is your certified Catalyst Property Condition Report. Again, this must be signed off on by a local official. The third is your Catalyst Fund workbook, my personal favorite. This is a Microsoft Excel file that will contain your project budgets and an overall summary of your financial requests. It is very important that this is properly filled out and that all instructions contained within the workbook are followed. The fourth and final piece is your ASTM environmental questionnaire. This is a form on our website provided by our partners at Brightfields Incorporated, which will help us to understand a little bit more about the history of the subject property with regards to environmental hazards. Here, you will see the cover page of the actual Catalyst Fund application. As you can see, there are several items 
that you as the developer will need to certify. Please take care to read each item thoroughly as you will be held to what you agree to here. If your application cover page is not signed, we will not be accepting your application. Now you will see a few of the places where the application will request some basic information about the applicant, such as the name of your organization, address, date of incorporation, and your EIN. It also asks for information on your development team, including the architect, engineer, general contractor, and more. It is important that we collect all of the information requested so that we can truly understand who you are. Next, you will see some of the more in-depth questions that are included in the application. On the top here, you will see that the financing need is requested. You will not be able to properly fill this in unless you have completed your Catalyst Fund Excel workbook and the numbers need to match up with each other. If the numbers here provided have no basis, your application will not move forward. Below, you will see questions about the project description. While we do not have a minimum word count, we encourage all developers to include as comprehensive and thoughtful of a response as possible, as this will affect the evaluation of your responses and overall application. Here is a specific list of the application questions. Describe the location of the proposed property. Attach a map showing the location of those properties. Include any information about other revitalization work in the target area undertaken by the applicant or groups. Please explain how the project fits into the broader community development strategy and how it will have a meaningful impact on the area. Describe any prior experience working in the neighborhood where the project is proposed and any commitment to local hiring. Briefly describe specifics on the scope of work, including the type of construction, materials used for exterior structure, and unit details. Description of current condition, use, zoning, etc., attaching supporting documentation. And finally, describe any energy efficiencies or quality standards to be used as well as the project amenities and how they compare with any other housing being developed within the market area, including specific model numbers or materials used to meet standards in place. I would now like to invite the DSHA and Cone Resnick team to speak farther on the application questions so that we can review some recommendations when completing the Catalyst Fund application. Thanks, Joel. I'm going to go ahead and take the first slide. Today, my colleague Katie and I are going to discuss how to construct a strong application. This is in an effort to limit the amount of RFIs that go back and forth and increase review efficiency so that in turn, we're able to quickly review applications and get those approvals back to you all. Here you'll see the two themes of completion and consistency. We want to ensure that all fields are completed. The cover page must be signed by the developer and there's also a check of all the items that must be included as exhibits within the application path. Each of these exhibits should be clearly identified within the application package with a very clear title. For example, a list of completed development projects for the last five years must be included as an exhibit, but this should be separate from any personal key personnel resumes and appropriately labeled. The second theme here is consistency. We want to see consistency across the application and all of the included exhibits. So for example, construction timelines, square footage, and all of the other details must match throughout all of the provided documentation. One thing we've seen a couple of times is the square footage listed in the subsidy calculation worksheet does not match the application or the included exhibits. So keeping everything consistent across all of the documentation will help to decrease the amount of RFIs, and increase review efficiency. With that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Katie for some themes on how to construct strong narrative answers. Thanks, Michaela. We can, there we go. 
so we wanted to also provide some recommendations for making sure that your narrative answers are as comprehensive as possible. First, each question is broken down into several parts. Please make sure that you're responding to all parts of the question. That will help ensure that your responses are thorough and detailed. Please also make sure that you're writing your answers in the space provided in the application. This helps us dramatically with efficiency in reviewing our applications. When you're referring to an exhibit, please make sure you include its title and the page number where it's located or copy and paste that information directly into the application. Please also remember to be detailed and specific with your answers. Your responses should be concrete, evidence-based, and individualized. For example, when you're responding to the meaningful impact question, uh, we can go back one slide still. Thank you. When you're responding to the meaningful impact question, you'll want to think about the long-term economic impacts as well as how those impacts tie into the city's overall community development strategy. We've included a few example responses here to highlight some specifics around what we're looking for. We can go to the next slide. Thank you. The first example we have here is in response to the question about experience working in the neighborhood and commitment to local hiring. And just as a note, we'll make sure that these slides are available to everyone, so I won't read through the full answer. We just want to touch on the pieces that make this response uh, a great example. The first paragraph here highlights specific related contracting experience in the area. They provide the exact location of the prior work, how much those projects cost to renovate, how much they sold for, and the specific trades involved. This really helped to demonstrate how similar those projects were to the current project. The second paragraph provides information on the specific avenues that the developer will use to build their pipeline of local hires, as well as detailed information about the number and type of jobs they expect to be created. I'm gonna hand it back to Michaela for the next slide. Thanks, Katie. This slide is showing an excellent answer to the question surrounding energy efficiencies and standards and how those project amenities compare to other housing being developed in the area. An answer that we've seen on a lot of previous applications is we will abide by DSHA's energy efficiency standards. And unfortunately, this is not a sufficient answer because it does not touch on each parts of the question. This answer here on the slide is great because it calls out exactly which energy efficiencies that they will be installed and how they are different from the homes in the area, both new and old. They're not just telling us, they're showing us. I'll turn it back to Katie. And our next example is in response to the request for supporting documentation on the home sales price and any comparative market analysis that was performed. Ultimately, what we're looking for here is a concise summary of the comparative market analysis, which specifically tells us how the sales price was reached. It should include what the comps were, what the prices per square foot were, and how those inform the price of the properties on the application. It's also important that whatever CMA is used is specifically cited in your response with an exhibit title and page number. So here you'll see the example of upload three, page 35. That might not be the exact wording that you use or that might not be the exact title of your document, but it's a great example of citing your work so that we can efficient, efficiently reference directly to it in the documents and expedite our review. I'll hand it back to Michaela for the next slide. For our last example of a great detailed and specific answer, we chose one regarding the marketing strategy and how to find program eligible home buyers. This answer really details how the realtor intends to target and build a pipeline of eligible applicants. Rather than just stating that the activities will target eligible population, the author of this answer points to how each of their pipeline expanding activity targets that population. 
a couple of things to call out here is the community outreach events. Instead of saying, we're going to have community outreach events, they say, we're going to have community outreach events in areas with high concentrations of target population individuals. They also note that they're going to leverage down payment assistance programs, which is great. These are generally targeted to, targeted to individuals in the same AMI levels as the eligible home buyers for the Catalyst program. And the last couple of themes that we want to touch on are in regards to the subsidy calculation worksheet. So if we go to the next slide, we have two themes here um, that we've had to issue quite a few RFIs to fix. So the first is sources. If you all have an other subsidy, so that may be a grant from a nonprofit agency, you want to include that in the sources and in the status box, you want to write which entity gave you that other subsidy. As part of your application package, you should include any award or commitment letters and grant agreements as supporting documentation. And lastly, uses. There are quite a few line items under both hard and soft costs, but we understand that that might not cover all of the potential uses that you may have. So we've included an other amount under both hard and soft costs. You'll notice that most of the line item cells are locked so that you cannot edit them. However, each of the other cells are unlocked so that you can put in what exactly that other use is. And you just wanna ensure that you label that in the worksheet to make it clear. With that, we will turn it back to Joel. Thank you so much, Katie and Michaela. We really appreciate you breaking down those specific examples. Here are a list of tips and tricks that summarize a lot of the information uh, you all just heard um, that I would like to encourage you all to reflect upon when putting together your responses. Um, we're not going to go through all of these, but I did want to uh, read out a few of my favorites in particular, such as describe how the energy efficiency criteria will be met, citing specific model numbers and materials to be used. Um, elaborate on the types of jobs that will be created and how you plan to hire locally. Include all buildings in the construction timeline and detail the amenities that will be included in the development, included, including how they compare to other properties in the market area. Finally, include information on whether a pipeline of buyers has been established and use this information um, use this information when completing your home sales section. It will really help us to truly understand your plan of attack. Next, let's move on to due diligence requirements. While going through the Catalyst Fund application process, you will of course get familiar with our due diligence checklist and requirements, which is broken out into eight categories total. The first four categories are your project description, financial projections, construction information, and market information. Within those sections, you will be asked to supply information such as a list of all addresses, current ownership, a detailed scope of work, information on your development team, a detailed timeline, of course, a completed sources and uses, which would come from your workbook, uh, a contractor's cost estimate or statement of work, and sales comparables, specifically put together by a realtor or broker. We do not want you all to put together your own data and put together a report. We need a sales comparable or CMA uh, put together by a real estate professional. The next four sections are borrower financials, guarantor financials, borrower organization diligence, and visuals. These sections include items such as three years of personal tax returns, three years of business tax returns, a personal financial statement, a real estate owned schedule, a schedule of contingent liabilities, 
schedule, I, mean, I apologize, certificate of formation, a resume or biography, an organizational chart, and of course, site, photos, and elevations. It is critical that all items shown on this list ultimately make their way into your underwriting folders. If these items are not present in your initial su submission or in the time period requested shortly thereafter, your application will not move forward. Here is a quick snapshot of the actual due diligence list pulled directly from the application. Make sure, please make sure to review this carefully and physically check each box when you have gathered the item so that you know everything is present. An application is considered incomplete when all of these items are not supplied. Next, let's take a look at the property condition certification form. This form is a relatively simple one asking for items such as the address, the parcel number, condition, and the permits needed. However, there is one item in particular that has been tripping people up a bit, and that is the signature on the following page. This form must be signed off on by a local official who is qualified to opine on the condition of a property. An example could be someone from a local public municipality, a local department of real estate and housing, a land bank representative, and more. Please do not sign the form yourself. And if you have questions, please feel free to reach out so we can assist. Now let's take a look at the Catalyst Fund Excel workbook. This model may look a bit intimidating at first. However, I want to assure you that it is relatively simple. This tool will allow us to analyze your project for financial feasibility within the program guidelines. This first page here is simply a summary tab which aggregates all of your subsidy requests from the individual tabs we will be seeing in a moment. It is important that you read the instructions here at the top of the summary tab. On this worksheet, please enter data into the cells that are highlighted in yellow only. Next, you will see the individual property tabs. There are five of these tabs in each model since you can apply for up to five homes at once. This is a sources and uses, which breaks out how you intend to allocate your budget among several categories of line items, inclusive of the acquisition costs, your hard costs, and your soft costs. From there, you will need to determine budgets on a granular level being careful to review each line item available so that you can be as specific and detailed as possible when constructing your budget. In most cases, your sources will be equal to your construction loan, and it will likely be just one source which is coming from our construction loan. As long as your project per unit is under $250,000, your construction loan should be equal to your total construction cost, unless you are building beyond $250,000 a unit, in which case you would need to bring your own source of funding beyond that $250,000. Once you complete this tab, the data will automatically be pulled onto our summary tab, which you saw on the previous slide. Lastly, let's review the ASTM questionnaire supplied by Brightfields, our environmental partner on the program. This is a short two-page form that is going to ask you some preliminary questions about your knowledge of the site, such as past uses of the property, whether or not you know of any chemical spills or environmental cleanups that may have occurred. The next page contains some checkboxes that you are also going to have to fill out to the best of your knowledge. This form is available in the Program Materials section of the Catalyst Fund landing page, and again, it is titled ASTM Questionnaire. You will need to ensure you sign the bottom of this page as well, and it is critical to your application process.
We are happy to answer questions on items such as the Excel workbook, application questions, general eligibility, and more. We can be reached at this email address and will commit to getting back to you all in a timely manner. The more preparations that you all do now, the less challenging the submission process will be when it comes time to accept the application. We look forward to hearing from you all and supporting your applications the best we can. Here is a quick glimpse of the round two timeline. We are hosting a second workshop on April 29th from 11 to 12.30. We are opening up round two officially on May 1st. On May 15th, the notice of intent to apply will be due. You can find this form located on the Catalyst Fund landing page in the Program Materials section. On May 30th, we will stop accepting applications for Round 2 at 11.59 p.m. We would now like to open the floor for questions, which will be supported by Ms. Diana Sargent. Good morning again, everyone. Um, feel free to ask a question via the chat and I will read the question on your behalf or you can use the raise hand function if you would like to ask a question to any of the presenters yourself. We have a question from Mr. Randy Washington. Good morning or afternoon. Uh, thank you for taking the question. Um, are there any restrictions for the Catalyst Fund um, as far as does it have to be for housing or can it be for, say, a community center, uh, community center or um, something like that, or training workshop center or? The... Okay. Um, the funds must be used for single family housing projects. Can I just add to that? It must be for single family for home ownership. It cannot be for rental under any circumstances. And it has to be for a household at or below 120% um, area median income. Perfect. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Please feel free to add your questions to the chat or use the raise hand function to present your question. We have a question from Peter Zoltowski. I started to type this, I apologize. It was just too much to type. So my question is uh, presumably properties that we're gonna rehab that are blighted at, and would require subsidy to make them feasible we wouldn't normally want to buy those properties if we don't end up getting the subsidy. So at what point after that May 30th cutoff, do we at least preliminarily find out if our property has been approved or rejected for the program? Because I'm assuming if I make offers on a property and get it under contract, I'm going to need a contingency that says, you know, me purchasing the property is contingent upon it getting accepted into the catalyst fund. Yes. So Given the nature of the program, we have not really been encouraging developers to sign or enter into a AOS, purchasing a, a property on the private market, unless the seller was cognizant of the timeline here. Um, in the past, developers have been sourcing properties from Department of Real Estate and Housing, land banks, entities that didn't have a push for time that could put them in a position such to lose an earning, earnest money deposit if, if one was down. Um, but to answer your exact question, Peter, the process is, it would take multiple months. And unless your seller was on the same page as you, and we could talk further on specifics offline if you like, I, I would not um, enter into anything 60 days, um, even 90 days, it, it, it would be tight. 
we, we, you, you should try to get yourself as long as a runway as possible. Did that answer your question, Peter? Um, sort of. I I feel like there's also logistical hurdles with only going after land bank properties because you also don't know. Like I wouldn't be able to know by May 1st or May 30th whether or not the land bank is going to agree to sell me something or, you know, Department of Real Estate and Housing. So I guess it's kind of no matter which way you go, there's hurdles. But a um, couple months, though, is if I find someone with maybe slightly unrealistic expectations of what they want for the property, it may still work as long as they're willing to wait potentially four months to find out whether or not it's going to get approved. Correct. And, and Okay. And Quick, quick second question. Um, uh, new construction is allowed under this, but I know that would pose its own challenges. But what if we would we be able to build a new construction five unit condo building if you sold off the condo units to individual owner occupants who met the requirements? So there would have to be individual deeds, of course, individual mortgages, and we we would really have to dive in to the specifics on this project, but as long as there was individual deeds at the end, individual parcels, everything was separated, it could likely be possible, but we would have to really sit down and look through this. Okay, and in that scenario, all the, the financial limits, you know, the, the 230,000 or $250,000 limit, all that would be multiplied by five? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Next, we have um, someone who's listed under iPhone. If you can unmute yourself and state your name. Um, and then after that person, we have Tanya Williamson. Hey, good morning, everybody. This is Kyle Trent. Morning. I am. Um, we're we're in a similar situation as um, Peter, so you somewhat answered the question, but I guess our our one of our questions was the time period that it would take. We have a lot of land that we're looking to put under contract. Um, will financing give room for the period of time it takes to parcel those off into separate parcels to allow them to be sold as individuals? Um. I may have to understand your situation a bit more, um, but again, I would be cautious of doing activities, even parceling them out um, before you further got down the road here. Okay, so yeah, we, we wouldn't do anything until if and when we were approved. It would be like a contingent offer on the land. And then um, obviously following approval or denial, we'd move forward with the process that it would take to parcel them down in the individual lots. Before we move on to um, Tanya, I just wanted to circle back to the question around regarding condos um, to say that condos are not permissible um, it, it has to be an individual single family home. So I just want to make sure that for um, the purposes of this conversation, um, if anyone on the call is thinking about a condo approach, that condos are not permissible uh, for this program and they must be um, an individual single family home. So hopefully that uh, clarifies the question before and if anyone else was um, thinking about that, um, just wanted to let you all know so that you can include that in your development planning process. Um, next, we have Tanya Williamson. Thank you, Deanna, and thank you, Joel. Great presentation today. I do, I'm going to probably circle back to Peter again. Uh, at one of the questions that Peter asked. So I know if we don't go through the land bank or the real estate, Department of Real Estate Housing, and we source the property, um, I know they're not going to hold properties that long, like up to four months. Are we saying that this program takes four months to get a, a decision? Yes. Okay. It's so is it can take up to four months, right? So is there a um, 
a reimbursement if we have to move forward with the acquisition or purchase? Yes, you could reimburse yourself for some specific acquisition cost. Um, however, I would caution you, you would just have to, of course, stay organized and on the same page from as early yeah. as possible. So we, we were- We just aware. will park and lot the property until right. we get a decision, but you will reimburse me for the property, for purchasing the property, right? And yes. it can be a part of that whole reno, but we just it's keep it right on the forefront and then parking lot it until you, we get an approval and then we can go in and do the construction piece. Correct. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. I know we're not guaranteed approval of the loan. I guess I, I can't, I can't even say that. Right. But if mm -hmm. I'm moving into that piece in the acquisition, like, how do we know, even if it's four months, how do we know when we are like I, it's four months overall, but are we saying that the decision of the loan is lesser than four months or it's all within four months? The the decision actually comes at, at the end down the line. So the decision is not, not okay. early in the process. It's not early in the process. Okay. Yeah. All right. Just to, just to give you um, more information, Tanya, um, we have a, a process that we have to go through. So mm -hmm. after we um, receive the applications, uh, we um, work with an underwriter um, before we actually start underwriting um, your, your deal. Um, we have to order a couple of third party reports. Mm -hmm. So we have to wait until those reports come back. Um, and then our underwriter um, underwrites and analyzes the, the project and puts together a credit memo. Um, and then that credit memo will go to our loan committee for approval. Um, and once it meets approval, then we have then it has to go to DSHA for the subsidy approval. So it just has to go through a few stages and we're unable um, to confirm a final approval until we know we have both the loan and the subsidy approved. And once we have both of those approved, you essentially have a reservation. And then we can commit commence with moving forward with closing your loan. So that's just giving you a little background around the, the process. So um, average four months, but we're hoping that we may be able to, you know, okay. um, moderate that, that time a little bit, but we're just trying to be as conservative as possible because we are dealing with real estate um, and we want to best manage everyone's expectations. All right. So that, well, it's good to know that you'll reimburse if we have to, but for land bank or for Department of Real Estate and Housing, if we find it and they... Okay, so I know I'm a, probably a little bit outdated with the procedure, so I just need to confirm or clarify. I know in the past we had to have the funds in an account to be able to show land bank, right? So if we're going through this and we're putting together all of the data and we're saying we found something at land bank that we want, but it's contingent all on your loan, is land bank willing to hold that property for four months for us? Joel, can you speak to that? Because I know that we did have some developers who um, acquire property from the land bank. I um. I believe that you would have to make that agreement or have that understanding with the land bank. We we haven't really been able to um, sway the land bank one way or the other. Developers have been coming to us with the word of someone at the land bank who committed a property to them, um, and and they honored that. That okay. arrangement. Um, okay. So we, would, so we would have to do the acquisition. We have to do the purchase, have that money for the purchase. But it's kind of like you guys would be able to tell, write a letter or whoever to say that we're pending on the construction side. Is that okay? So pe people have come to us not owning the property that they wanted to purchase through the land bank. People have come to us owning the property. Mm -hmm. uh, land bank is aware of what's going on at this okay. point. And so... I think if you let them know you were a considering it, okay. they may be supportive. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. 
I do again one last one to, to highlight the timing though they know how long this has been taking so I want to add the caveat that um, the timing would have to make sense for them as well. Thank you. So we don't want to scare you all. We we have been able to um, approve uh, seven deals for 24 units. So we have um, our developers have been able to figure out how to make it work with the acquisition. Um, so so it does it does work. Um, but like Joel said, um, if you're looking at um, working or acquiring property from the land bank, um, we suggest you reach out to them um, and, and see how you can partner with them. Um, and same with the city. If you're looking at acquiring property from the city, I would definitely um, talk to them um, sooner rather than later because their process, if it is directly from the city and it's not being disposed of to the land bank, it's a little bit different because they have to go to city council for approval if it's straight from the city and if it's not um, being disposed of to the land bank for acquisition. Um, we do have two um, more questions in the chat. So the first one is from Cordaro Rhodes. His question is, who does the notice of intent need to be submitted to at Sanair? Is there an email address or form that needs to be submitted? So Joel? That is an excellent question. <laughs> and I don't think we uh, touched on that, but we would like you to submit it to the DE, the DE Catalyst at Sanair email, please. That's DE Catalyst at Sanair. And we can put that in the chat for you all as well. Thank you. Um, and then the next question is from Vedra Johnson. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. If not, my apologies. What's the total amount you are willing to subsidize? If the proposal is more than what you are willing to subsidize, can you still get approved for the program? Thank you. So the maximum subsidy per unit is $120,000. Beyond that, we cannot commit any additional subsidy, and that would be our max limit, $120,000. If you are looking to subsidize further, you would have to utilize your own funds or another source of funds to do that. Thank you. Um, we have another question for from Tanya. Before, um, before I go to Tanya, I just want to add that um, for those who would like more information about the structure of the Catalyst Fund and how it works, um, we did an information session last year before we launched. We strongly encourage you to review that video that is on our website. Um, if you um, if you put in Sanair Catalyst Fund, um, or even if you put in the Delaware, Delaware State Housing Authority Catalyst Fund, um, I believe it's on their site too. I strongly recommend that you review that information session to understand how the fund um, actually works, um, the maximum amount of subsidy that you're eligible for, the eligible areas, so on and so forth. We did not review that information in detail here because we really wanted to focus on how to submit a strong application. But if you're not um, familiar with how the fund works, we strongly recommend that you go back and you review that presentation and that slide deck to help prepare you um, for this application or to just confirm that you are actually eligible um, or your project is eligible for um, this fund. Tanya? Just one more question. So once it's approved or once it's decisioned and say it's approved, right? The disbursement time frame. Is it a hundred percent disbursement once it's approved? So how the funding works is there are three advances. The first advance is at closing, which equates to 40%. The second advance is at 50% completion, which is another 40%. And the remainder comes at completion and sale. So does that 40% can that 40% include the uh, acquisition? Yes, it does. 
They can. And will it allow me sufficient funds to do the reno start the renovation? Yes, yeah, so that's actually something or a part of what you will have to determine factoring in the acquisition costs. What, what, what I will say is if your acquisition took up a big portion of that 40% and you had other uses for the other expenses, you would likely be move, be able to quickly move to your second request, uh, your second advance. And again, I would just want to be very conscious of making your uses uh, and source, of course, and you have know that you would know this, of course, tie, make, making sure everything ties out mm -hmm. and you can do everything you need to do within the 250 and the developer fee and this acquisition cost. So, is it, so it's those three three draws, three disbursements. Once the final disbursement is done, final disbursement is done at that point. Um, when do I receive the subsidy back? Is it after the sell? The subsidy actually is not released until the sale of the property. And how it works is you have an outstanding loan, let's say $250,000. You sell this home for $150,000. The sales proceeds are $140,000. That $110,000 that is still owed to us is actually going to be released directly from DSHA to Sanair, making us whole. Mm -hmm. And so that the subsidy is is not released until the sale. And that goes directly from DSHA to Sanair. You don't touch the, you don't receive the subsidy. Okay. All right. But all of that washes on your end. You'll send me documentation. Yes. And we should be made whole. And your right? loan is done. Done. Correct. Okay. And, and Tanya, just going back to your question about the advance. Um, so we modeled a couple of deals um, at the beginning of this. Um, and use that information to come up with an advanced percentage structure that will hopefully help all of the developers get started. So we settled on 40% um, with the intent that it'll be enough for you to get started with your acquisition, your site work, and, and some of those preliminary um, const construction work. Um, so the 40% should be enough for you all to get started and get you to 50% completion. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Thank you. Any other questions um, that you'd like to share in the chat? We have one more, it looks like, from Kyle. Um, sent directly to me, so you all can't see it. That may have been an accident. Um, are we permitted to offer additional support for our buyers, i.e. seller's assist? Hmm. That's a great question. Um, I, I, I may have to confirm, I think there's a certain percentage that is a, a cap of how much uh, that can be contributed. I'm not sure if this encompasses other down payment assistance, for example, like the city of Wilmington or from a, a nonprofit. Um, so I, I honestly would have to get back to you on that. Um, but it's a great thought, um, very generous, and we will get back to you on that. Or um, 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 unless, Diana, you have something you'd like to say there. No, that that would that would be my response. Um, I think we should um, talk about it off offline and then get back to um, Kyle. Yes, thank you. Um, but again, we want to uh, reiterate the amount of down payment assistance available uh, in the city and state right now, um, and those amounts are up to ten and fifteen thousand dollars in some cases, um, even some coming from. Uh, lending companies. I know a lot of the mortgage, CRA mortgage lenders are introducing a lot of new programs. So evaluate those first, get as much in line. Let's let's get as much in line as we can. And then we can also revisit this seller's assist.
Thank you, Joel. Any other questions? Is this the, uh, this will be the last round, I assume? Um, we're not sure yet, um, but I would say that if you're interested in applying, um, I would encourage you to submit for this round. And Deanna, you mentioned uh, seven deals from the previous round. Or is that the target for the second round, uh, roundabout, or um, do you have an idea on that? We have uh, a very a similar amount of loan funds that will be available for this second round. So we are projecting a similar number of deals to be funded. Yes, and I, I will add that we are hoping to see more applications um, of five units, four to five units. Um, the maximum number of units um, that can be in an application is five. Um, so we're hoping to see more applications with um, close to that maximum included. Yes, thank you, Deanna. We are also hoping to fund projects that are not only in the city of Wilmington, but projects that are all across the state. So please get creative. Um, as you have seen, sometimes it may take time to get to the land bank. Well, Dover, Laurel, Milford, uh, I'm sure have some opportunities as well. So please get creative in that approach. Anyone else have any questions? One thing I also wanted to mention related to down payment assistance or resources that the Delaware State Housing Authority itself has so many robust partnerships with lenders around the state. So if you're not sure where to go or would like to understand what resources could be available there for your potential buyers, uh, I encourage you to explore all the mortgage-related, lending-related resources that DSHA has because they, they have quite a bit in place. Looks like we are not hearing further questions, Deanna. Do you think it's okay to move on or should could we wait a few more minutes? Um, final call. Okay, we do have one more question from Ms. Jacinta Puckett. Hi, Joel and Deanna, everyone. Maybe I missed it because um, I'm on the website for Centenaire. I don't see a notice, to notice um, of intent to apply a form, an actual form. You are extremely observant. We actually do need to put that up, and I will be putting that up right after this call working with my team. Okay. Thank you for pointing and out. Also, the, um, the DSHA, um, understanding the DSHA's grant restriction agreement, that link isn't working. Okay. Thank you for letting us know. We will have our team look at that link right after this call as well. Okay. Thank you. Looks like we have a hand from Tanya. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just had to raise a good question. The, the grant restriction agreement, what, what restrictions, what specific high level restrictions are we talking about? Yes, great question. So what this is, is it's actually a five-year subsidy retention agreement. And this okay. actually is ultimately signed by your buyer and what it is, is the buyer actually has to or supposed to stay in the property for at least five years to realize the full benefit of that subsidy. Each year they stay in the property, the liability of the subsidy reduces by 20%. However, the goal, of course, is to keep them in there for five years, after which that retention agreement is wiped away. And the homeowner now has a property that's likely worth significantly more than they they paid for it. Um, but we're hoping to create and preserve some of the affordability and the uh, 
retention agreement is the way we're hoping to do it. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Great question. You ask a lot of great questions, Tanya. So please keep them coming right. if you have them. I just want to make a quick um, note of correction. Um, apologies for any confusion. We will have the notice of intent to apply um, form and instructions um, available on the Senior um, Catalyst Fund website by the end of this week. So, um, so we'll have that up by the end of this week. It looks like those are all the questions, um, Joel. I don't have any um, additional questions in the chat. Um, so if you want to move on to the closeout, you're more than welcome to. All right. Thank you so much. And please, of course, remember, you can email us at the address that we have shared, eecatalyst at senere.com, if you think of any questions later. So thank you all very much much for taking the time out of your busy lives to be here with us today. For next steps, I highly recommend you visiting our Senere Catalyst Fund landing page located at www.senere.com. And you will be able to find further information about the program and access all of the program materials in this purple box right here, included the, including the to be added notice of intent to apply form. We very much look forward to hearing from you all and supporting your applications the best that we can. Thank you so much and have a great day, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a good one. Thank you. Thanks. Have a great day.